Section 19 of The Family Kitchen Gardener. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer W. The Family Kitchen Gardener by Robert Boyst. Section 19. Gooseberry. Ribes grossularia. Grosse à macro, French. Stockbestrau, German. This fruit, so extensively cultivated in Britain, and also in some parts of this country, is not at all adapted to a southern climate. It is only occasionally that a crop is attained here, even with the best of care. It requires a cool climate, or some local cause, to attain the perfection for which it is so justly celebrated. It is the native of this country and Europe. We have seen it wild on the Allegheny Mountains, and before we see it perfect in culture, we must reproduce from our native sorts. It is highly esteemed in culinary purposes for tarts and preserves, and when fully ripe is laxative and considered a very wholesome dessert fruit. The finest crops we have seen in this country were grown in the vicinity of Montreal and the lakes, and near Pittsburgh, between Allegheny and Monongahela rivers, over which the smoke of that city of iron continually rolls, during June, July, and August, which entirely prevents the mildew, the only enemy to the culture of this fruit in this quarter. There are a thousand varieties of it, which may be detailed in reds, whites, yellows, and greens, all fancifully named according to the ideas of the growers. They ripen from the middle to the end of July. Propagation The method is precisely as detailed for currants, both in culture and pruning. In warm seasons, just after rain, some sorts are frequently attacked with mildew, which baffles our skill to prevent though we may retard its progress by showering them with sulphur water. The cure, however, is nearly as bad as the disease. Mildew makes its appearance about the middle of June in the form of brownish-white spots on the fruit. As soon as observed, the berries may at once be pulled for the kitchen or market, for they never get over it, and the longer they hang, the worse they become. It is not soil that is the cause, for we have had them some seasons all destroyed, while last year the same plants in the same ground were as fine as they could be, in size, form, and flavor. It is an atmospheric disease, and only that. The fruit is in size from half an inch to two inches in diameter. The medium-sized are the best flavored. The very largest have been known to weigh an ounce and a half, but they are uniformly of inferior quality. For flavor, none excel the following. Reds. Red Warrington. Champagne. Roaring Lion. Rough Red. Red Jam. Lancashire Lad. Whites. Queen of Sheba. White Eagle. Venus. White Smith. White Sulphur. Hedgehog. Yellows. Golden Yellow. Early Sulphur. Yellow Ball, Golden Hero, Ashton Yellow, Viper. Greens. Gregory's Perfection, Green Ocean, Green Laurel, Green Gage, Jolly Angler, Green Gascoigne. Grape. Variants, Vigne, French, Weintrauben, Germany. The culture of the vine is spoken of in the remotest ages. The antediluvians were no doubt perfectly familiar with its growth and manufacture into an intoxicating drink. Providence, with a bountiful hand, distributes copiously over the earth those fruits which are for the comfort and luxury of man, who frequently converts these blessings into a curse, manufacturing with his own hands an engine for his destruction. The practice of not allowing vines to mature till their fourth year was inculcated by Moses, who lectured on the subject to the Israelites. The Egyptians ascribed the manufacture of wine to Osiris, and the Grecians to Bacchus, whom, for the discovery, they elevated to the rank of a deity. Pliny describes many kinds of grapes, one shaped like a finger, which appears to be lost. They had a vine at that period, near Rome, that annually produced about three barrels of pear juice. In those days, young men under thirty, and women all their lifetime, were forbidden to drink wine. How would these regulations suit the moderns? Plato loved wine. He said nothing more excellent or valuable than wine was ever granted by God to man. 
Ignatius Marenius killed his wife with a billet of wood, having caught her drinking wine. He was tried and acquitted of murder, but history does not say whether it was by his gold or a justification in the circumstances that he obtained his freedom. Cato records that the custom of kinfolk kissing women when they meet was to know by their breath if they had been drinking wine. There is no fruit so wholesome, none so generally palatable, none that can be so universally cultivated, and none so remunerating as the grape. Its rapidity of growth, productiveness, long life, and simplicity of culture may enable every farmer, at least, to live literally under his own vine. But there is not a farmer or planter from New York to New Orleans but may cultivate, with a very small outlay, an abundance of this fruit. I never see long, naked post-rail fences, but am reminded of the neglect of this fruit. Not that it does not deserve the very best of ground, the most studied culture, but here is a waste of land and the very support that would produce thousands of tons of this inestimable fruit. The extent of its culture in Ohio and other states is rapidly increasing. N. Longworth, Esquire of Cincinnati, a zealous horticulturist, has one hundred acres under culture which he rents out to Swiss and German vine dressers, who therefrom have an excellent living and make him a bountiful return. The fruit is manufactured into wine and sold from seventy-five cents to a dollar fifty per gallon, and the produce of that vicinity is about six hundred barrels. This is merely a drop in the bucket, compared with the immense import of the past year. Footnote 1. After deducting the export, there remains for home consumption 5,105,166 gallons, at a cost of $1,131,038. Item 2. For this purpose, their standard grape is the Catawba, and other native grapes, of which the following are the best. If our own advice could prevail, we would plant only Isabella and Catawba, or improve varieties therefrom. Bland or Powell. Color pale red, fruit round, bunches short, with two or three shoulders when well grown. Flesh pulpy, with a half-sweet, sub-acid flavor, and a little of the peculiar musky tinge characteristic of the fox grape. Foliage pale green underneath, and more rounding than any of the following sorts. Catawba one of the best native grapes, bunches rather regularly formed with a few shoulders, fruit round of a bright red or coppery color when ripe, flesh pulpy, rather juicy, and sweet when fully ripe, with a musky flavor. Foliage pale green, with white down underneath, and more reflects than that of the Isabella, which it very much resembles. This variety is most esteemed for wine, and when fully ripe, in my estimation, is the best of our native grapes for the table, though I cannot go so far as to say it is luscious and high-flavored. Elsingborum, Elsingborum, Elsingburg. This grape is a native of the sandy soils of New Jersey, where it is considered the best of the American grapes. Bunches small, compact and shouldered, berries small, jet black, round with a thin skin. Flesh without pulp, sweet and well flavored. Foliage coarse, deeply five lobed, wood slender, very hardy. Isabella. This variety is hardier than any of the former, and may be cultivated as far north as the St. Lawrence. Bunches long, tapering with very few shoulders. Berries oval, jet black, with a fine bloom. S skin thick. Flesh a little pulpy, very sweet, with a little touch of the musky flavor ripe about the end of September, but improves by hanging on the vines till frost. I have repeatedly handed ripe fruit of this grape, with that of the black Hamburg, to individuals entirely unacquainted with the flavor of grapes, and they have generally pronounced the Isabella the best and sweetest grape. Foliage large, three-lobed, with a white down underneath, wood very strong, of a brownish-red color. Ohio, or the Seeger box grape. This variety was brought in to notice by Mr. Longworth of Cincinnati. Its history is rather obscure, though there is no doubt of it being a native. It approaches nearer the Elsingbird than any other we cultivate, but it is not so hardy of that sort. Bunches long, compact, and tapering, with one or two shoulders. Berries small, round, and jet black, with a thin skin. Flesh sweet and well flavored, the seeds large wood strong, shorter jointed than either the Isabella or Catawba, and requires to be laid in thin, 
or the fruit rots off before ripening. The plant is rather tender for us, being severely injured with me last winter. All our native grapes ripen from the 1st of September to the 1st of October, but I have found the flavor greatly improved by hanging on the vine as long as possible, keeping clear of frost. There are few bunches that will weigh one pound. Propagation of the native grape is a very simple process. They will all grow assuredly from layers of the preceding year's wood, or even the wood of the current year. All that is required is merely to bend a shoot to the ground, make a hole four inches deep, and place the bend in the shoot of it. Cover it up firmly with earth, give it frequent waterings in dry weather. In the month of November it will be fit to cut from the parent to the plant in the vineyard, or any other required locality. When it is planted out, cut it down to about two eyes from the ground. Allow one of those only to grow the following season. It is also propagated by cuttings very generally, though there are some sorts rather shy to root by this method. We also grow them from eyes, as directed for foreign vines. Grafting can also be accomplished on the vine. Allow the stock to grow till it has made a leaf or two, and then take a scion that has been retarded in a cool place, and prepare it either for whip or wedge grafting. By cuttings. The shoots of the last season's wood, cut into lengths of about a foot long of many of the sorts, and planted into any rich, light soil, nearly their whole depth, will root in one season, and by care and pruning they will grow into fine plants in two years, when they should be planted out where they are intended to remain. Soil The native vine will grow in any kind of soil, except that of a wet or clayey nature, and on any exposure and situation except low valleys, where in some season it mildews and drops its fruit. The best soil is a rich and friable loam, under which there is a stony, sandy, or gravelly bottom. They do not require excessively rich soils, but they stand in need of semi-annual dressings with manures or rich composts, and if this is withheld they will deteriorate in quality and quantity. The soil must be properly ameliorated and enriched before planting, and if trenched with a spade or plough, the benefit derived will amply repay the cost. For vineyards, plant them six feet apart and eight feet from row to row. Train them to trellises or poles made of red cedar wood or white oak. Eight feet in height for field culture will be sufficient, but for city gardens, where borders of rich soils are prepared for them, they will grow to any height, even to the roof of a five-story dwelling, and there produce excessive crops. Trellises for training may be made of any shape or form, but those that are upright are preferable pruning. On the proper execution of this operation greatly depends the prosperity and fruitfulness of the vine. There is frequently so great a mystery thrown around these simple attentions that the timid are afraid to even touch the vine with a knife, while others, whose boldness goes farther than their knowledge, cut right and left with considerable dexterity, feeling satisfied if they show that the wood is at least cut off. To cut the shoots from three to ten eyes of the preceding year's wood according to its strength is a good general rule. To put our ideas in tangible form, we will begin with a young plant. As above stated, cut it within two eyes from the ground, from which allow one shoot to grow for the first season, and now call it a plant one year old. If the soil is in good order, it will be fifteen feet long. In November, or before February, Cut that shoot to about two feet from the ground, and allow three shoots to grow. They will each attain fifteen to twenty feet. It is now two years old. About the same period of the season lay the two lowest of these shoots horizontally, and cut them to about twenty inches from the main stem. The most upright cut it about two feet from the stem, and allow the plant to make fruits this the third year. Six bunches will be quite enough. The plant being now formed, and having made in the fourth season a quantity of branches all covered with fruit, it is advisable to take only one bunch off each, and never take more than two. Leading branches will be required for the future plant. These may extend to fill up any given space, but all others must be topped two eyes beyond the fruit. That is, leave on two leaves nearer the extremity of the shoot, then the bunches hang. This topping should be performed early in June and when they make fresh shoots, top them again and again. The leading shoots must also be topped as soon as they are at their required length. Where vines are needed to cover high arbors or reach the top of dwellings, the shoots in the first and second year may be left from six to ten feet long. 
Summer pruning is generally very injudiciously performed. The vines are allowed to grow in every form till July or August, when they are thinned out and deprived of a great deal of young wood and foliage, at the very time the plants require to have it. Go over the vines in May, and deprive them of all the branches that crowd each other. Six inches to twelve apart is proper distance to lay in young wood. Rub off all others, using only the finger and thumb in the operation. Tie in the shoots as they advance, and top them as soon as they have made two eyes growth beyond the fruit, except the leaders, as above intimated. There is nothing in the above that is not perfectly simple, and may be put in practice by any farmer along every fence trail. Foreign Grape this is the Viltus vinifera of the botanists, a fruit of the East, where it luxuriates in profusion, being the food and drink of many of the inhabitants of these countries. In these climates it grows without limit, and even under the dry, genial suns of France and the countries bordering the Mediterranean Sea, it attains great perfection. This climate, however, is inimical to its growth, and after bearing a few years it suddenly dies off. Its perfection can only be attained under glass, but with that as a cover, and a knowledge of the cause and effect of the disease to which it is subject, will amply repay the attention paid to its culture. For such a purpose, we introduce the following varieties. Black Frontingian, a very rich flavored grape with a peculiar musky flavor. Bunches rather small, long and compact berries medium size, thin skin, covered with a violet bloom. A good bearer bunches about one pound in weight. Black Hamburg is the best of all grapes, taking into consideration its combined qualities of productiveness, large size, and fine flavor. Bunches rather tapering, with two or three shoulders, making what is called a well-shouldered bunch. Berries large, sometimes four inches in circumference, rather round, of a jet-black color, but vary very much under different treatment in a warm, moist, or dry atmosphere, ripening from a pale red to its proper color, skin rather thick, flesh rich, juicy, and melting. It is a very large bunch, weighing three pounds. Black Prince If the black Hamburg has a rival, it is in this grape. In this vicinity, growers generally prefer it. Bunches tapering and well-shouldered, berries large of a fine black, not so closely set upon the bunch as the Hamburg flesh-melting, juicy, and high-flavored, a great bearer and always colors well. A very large bunch will weigh three pounds. Wood strong. Charge Herding A black grape from the south of France, introduced by me four years ago. Bunches long and tapering, berries medium size, colored jet black with a violet bloom. Fresh-melting, very juicy, spicy, and sprightly, flavored distinct from any other grape. A great bearer, either in pots or in the ground, Bunches from a pound to a pound and a half. Chassisla Golden, White Chassisla, Royal Muscadine, White Muscadine, Chassisla de Fontainebleau, with many other names, all belong to two varieties of the grape, very much assimilated, and in which there is great confusion. Bunches long and tapering, with one or two shoulders. Berries medium size of a white, changing to bright, transparent golden color when fully exposed to the sun flesh tender, melting, rich, and sugary, a prolific bearer. We have seen a vine in a pot with twenty-nine bunches of fruit on it. Descartes Superb A new grape imported by me three years ago, and promises to be the finest white grape we have in culture for size and bearing, with an excellent flavor. Bunches large, well-shouldered, berries perfectly round, three to four inches in circumference, of a greenish-white color. Flesh and flavor very similar to Hamburg, a strong grower. Muscat of Alexandria. Bunches large, as broad as they are long. Berries oval of a fine yellowish-white color. Flesh firm with a rich, sweet, musky flavor peculiar to this variety. Few seeds. Requires to be fully transparent before being cut. In fact, it's not ripe until it begins to shrivel. Many growers cut it before maturity. A large bunch will weigh two pounds. A very strong grower. Muscat Blanc Catif, or Early White Muscat. A very early sort, with well-formed bunches, berries perfectly round of a yellow-white color, flesh very rich, juicy, spicy, and high-flavored, a great bearer, large bunches will weigh a pound and a half. Red Fontignon, or Grizzly Fontignon. Bunches large and tapering,
berries perfectly round, of a copper or red color, medium size and set thickly on the bunch. Flesh rich, spicy, juicy, and excellent, the best of the grapes. When once tasted, if perfectly ripe, it will not be forgotten. The fruit should hang on the vine till it begins to shrivel. A large bunch will weigh a pound and a half. West's St. Peter's or Black Lombardy. Bunches very long, fifteen inches if well grown. Berries round, of a dull red color, closely set, flesh juicy and melting. Will hang on the vines till frost, for this is valuable. Foliage very much lobed, very large branches. Will weigh two and a half to three pounds. A strong grower and great bearer. White Fontignon. In character and flavor are like the red color of a waxy white with fine powdery bloom on the fruit. White sweet water, very early. Bunches rather small, as is the fruit. Berries round of a pale green transparent color. Flesh thin, sugary, and sweet. A very distinct sort. Large bunches will weigh one pound. Erections. We here admit that the above described grapes cannot be grown in the open air with any degree of success. We therefore propose to give a simple detail for a cheap and permanent structure for their protection. There are few gardens of any pretensions that have not glass sash for hot beds, pits, etc. during winter. By way of economy, and to suit those who are parsimonious in rural affairs, we propose erecting a building to suit those sashes which generally remain unemployed during the season from April to November, the very time that the grape vines require their aid. Admit that the sashes of these frames are six feet long, and those of the pit are seven feet, these, according to figure 25, will cover a grapery nine feet high at the back, ten feet wide, and seven feet high in front, allowing two feet for a low front wall or plank. This grapery may be of any length, and can be placed against any wall, building or good permanent fence, at very little cost, and from it heavy crops of grapes may be obtained every year. In the winter season the vines are to be laid down, after being pruned, in any convenient position, and protected by hay, straw, or boards. In April the vines can be tied up, and the sashes put on them whenever they can be spared from the frames and pits. For the admission of air, a portion of the sash can be movable and fixed with springs or hooks and staples. Soil There is very little difference of opinion in regard to the nature of soil genial to the growth and maturity of the grape. All agree that it should be light and porous on a dry bottom. The great grape-growing countries are that of nature, and the vineyards are all planted on rising ground or declivities. The various modes of accomplishing this is frequently very ludicrous. A great pit is prepared three to four feet deep, filled with one or two feet of stones, bricks, and other rough material, over which is put a mixture of awful bones, lime, and other rich manures, with a small portion of good virgin earth. In such receptacles the roots very soon rot, the vines become weak, and finally, after a few years of meager existence, they die, as might have been expected. If we could make a choice of locality, or even no choice, the most appropriate place on ground level would be to plant the vines on the surface, or, in other words, make the vine border above the ground. It would then always be dry and sweet, and if too dry, water might be given when required. The soils for the growth of this plant must be dry and free from the excess of moisture at any season. The excrementitious matter discharged from the roots of the vine is very great, and if this be given out in cold, retentive soils, they soon become diseased, and a pale and languid vegetation ensues. If, therefore, the bottom is not naturally dry, make it so by draining. Having obtained a dry bottom by rough materials of any description, Cover it to the desired height with fresh turf from a rich pasture, and dig in one-fourth of a well-decomposed manure, at least one year old, interspersing it with a few bones of any description, oyster shells, road scrappings from the turnpike, or any other enriching material that undergoes slow decomposition. The whole must be repeatedly turned and allowed to settle before the vines are planted. Extreme caution has to be used in administering bone dust, slaughterhouse offal, and other rich manures, especially if the vines are to be planted in the same season. The surface of the soil should have a descent to carry off rains and snows. Never crop vine borders, nor tread much upon them. Have a trellis walk laid on the soil for the daily operations of training, tying, pruning, etc. 
Stir up the surface of the border once a year with the fork, and give it a dressing of manure. From these remarks it must not be inferred that the vines will not grow unless in richly prepared soil. They will grow well in poor, dry, sandy soils, provided they have annually a good portion of rich vegetable or animal matter dung in them every autumn, and the covering of manure during winter, the rains passing through which will strengthen the soil and enable it to give great growths and good crops. Propagation this is frequently done by layers, of which we have given a hint under the culture of native grapes, also by cutting of last year's wood, but the best method of growing fine plants is by the single eye. This is the favorite mode of propagating plants for fruiting. Early in February or March we cut the shoots of the preceding year's wood into eyes, leaving about an inch on each side of the eye. Plant these with their eyes uppermost into pots, and place them under glass, either in cold or hot frames prepared for the purpose, or in the window of a warm room where they will be carefully watered. These eyes may easily be made to grow ten or twelve feet the first season, by constant repotting and watering with liquid manure. Plants grown by this method are decidedly the best rooted, forming more capillary fibers, consequently more nutritious support to the vine is absorbed. They form shorter joints and are capable of producing a greater quantity of fruit. We have seen a plant in the black Hamburg, only eighteen months from the eye, have nine bunches weighing about eight pounds. Transplanting If grape vines have been cultivated in pots, they may be transplanted at any period of the year, though we give preference to the months of October, November, March, or April. Admitting the ground is fully prepared, dig out a place for the reception of the roots, eighteen inches deep, and as wide as the roots require, to lay them at their full length without bending or twisting in any manner. If any of them are broken or diseased, cut them off. Keep the roots near the surface. Distributing among them fine earth, give each three or four gallons of water, allow it to subside when filled up with water, and press it down gently with the foot. In such a house as we have figured, one plant to each sash will be enough. The back of the house may be planted with figs, which should be covered up in winter, in the same manner as the vines. It is absolutely necessary for the health of the vine that it should be planted where the sun will fully shine upon it during some hours of the day. We have often observed small vines planted in front of the house, where they are entirely shaded from the sun, and had to struggle for weeks or months before they reached the full light and air. In such a case, it is preferable to grow the plants in pots till they are the required height. The first season's growth should be confined to one stem only, carefully cutting off all lateral shoots within two eyes of the main stem. Winter Pruning This subject is extensively treated on by all writers on the vine in the horticulture of Great Britain, and those who have undertaken the subject in this country appear to adopt their words. It may do in some soils and latitudes. But when put in practice here, many of the eyes intended for fruiting the coming season start to growth. The error we will take the liberty to point out. In the preceding paragraph we advise the first season's growth to be confined to one stem. This having been done, cut this shoot down to the bottom of the glass, and allow two shoots to grow from it the next season, and take one bunch of fruit from the strongest shoot if it shows any. These shoots are to be trained as far as they will grow. The writers say, top them when one-third, or, at farthest, halfway up the rafter. If this is done in our climate, and the vines are in strong health, one half of the eyes below the stoppings will grow at once, ruining the vine for one year. Our climate elaborates the juices of the plant so fully that a stoppage of its growth has two results, viz. either destroying the roots or causing a greater reproduction of wood, which in this case is a decided injury. The next winter cut the weakest shoot to about one eye from the previous year's wood, and the strongest lay in two or three feet of the past season's growth. This portion will have ten or twelve eyes, all of which will break and produce fruit. Take only one bunch from each eye. The other shoot allow to grow its full length without the fruit during the season. The next winter cut back the strong shoot that has produced the large crop to within two eyes of the old wood, and allow one shoot to grow therefrom. The strong shoot is said to be laid in, or cut back two to three feet long for fruiting, one shoot to be trained with fruit for the next year's crop. 
there may be on the vine four shoots, or the number required, one half of which lay in to fruit every year, and cut back the other half for fruiting the following season. This is termed the long cane system, and the one we recommend. Spur system of pruning, which is exceedingly simple in detail and practice, and the largest crops of grapes we have ever seen were from vines trained on this mode. It is as follows. Allow one shoot to extend from the plant the whole height of the house. If everything is in good order, this shoot will be at least three inches round. If under, there is a deficiency. Cut it back and give it another year's growth. If over it the vines are too strong, cut this shoot to about four feet of the old wood. From the sides of the stem young shoots or spurs push forth, which bear fruit. Take only one bunch from each, and stop the growth two eyes above the bunches. At each winter pruning these spurs are cut back, leaving two or three eyes to each. These again send out other spurs. Take one bunch from each, and so continue from year to year, and you will have fruit in great abundance, though not so fine as on the former method. Footnote. Since the above was prepared for the press, we have had an interview with one of the best grape growers under glass in the country, whose grapery last year we saw fruit of the finest quality in regard to color, size, and flavor. He adopts both methods of pruning, but greatly prefers the cane training as being the most simple, the vine having only one or two wounds made on it, the fruit swelling faster, coloring better, and maturing two weeks before that of the spur pruning, where the comparison was fair being without fire heat. He also syringes the vines freely, till the fruit is about the size of peas, and never afterward. He never saw a red spider on his vines, and very rarely mildew. Observe that all our remarks apply to grape houses without artificial heat. End of footnote. Many err in this system in taking two bunches of fruit from each eye instead of one only. Winter pruning should always be done as soon as the leaves have fallen, otherwise the vine is deprived of matter which would have been stored up in the remaining parts. Never prune back wood of the present year to one eye, as is usually recommended, but leave a long spur of three eyes. The eye or bud nearest the old stem is frequently blind, and even if it does show fruit, it is not so fine as the eyes farther up the shoot. But be careful to retain the best, and rub off the remainder at the earliest stage of growth always encouraging the base bud shoot to be retained for the next season's operation. Summer pruning must be strictly adhered to, stopping every shoot two leaves above the bunch, after which laterals or new shoots will soon be produced. These stop again every two weeks, and concentrate the energy of the plant on the swelling of the fruit. Thinning the fruit. This portion of culture is too frequently neglected. As soon as the berries are the size of small peas, Cut out about one-third of them with a pair of sharp pointed scissors. This will allow the others to swell more freely. Again, before they begin to color, if they appear crowded, thin out the smallest. This will not reduce the weight of the bunch, unless the thinning is carried to extreme. Never touch the fruit after it begins to color. Handling destroys the fine bloom on the fruit, which is a point of beauty. Tying up the shoulders does not improve the fruit, nor add to the effect. Routine of culture, under glass, without fire heat. As soon as the frosty nights are over, clean all the woodwork by washing or whitewashing. Lift up the vines from where they have been laid all winter, and wash them with strong soap suds or soft soap and tobacco water, rubbing off all the loose bark and cleaning them thoroughly. After which, tie them up into places appropriate for them. Every morning after they begin to grow, Give them a syringing with water about an hour after sunrise, provided the sashes are on the house. If the sashes are not on, they do not require it so frequently. About the end of April or the first of May, the sashes must necessarily be put on to protect the blossom, encourage the growth, and prevent injury in cold nights. When the fruit has set, the vines may be syringed every afternoon about four o'clock, having previously shut up the house, not to be opened again until the sun has fairly tempered the atmosphere next day, which will generally be from nine to ten o'clock, if the house fronts south, when air must be given by the top sashes, not allowing the thermometer to go higher than from ninety to a hundred and ten degrees. 
During the warm, cloudy days of July and August, mildew is sure to appear, and has frequently accompanied great destruction before it is discovered. It is readily known by a yellow, sticky transparency on the leaf, or a greasy, soft feel when you lay hold of it. The best cure is to give copious syringings of water, twice a day, giving plenty of air to the house from ten to three o'clock in the sunshine. If it is far gone, pour four gallons of boiling water over five pounds of flour or sulphur, stir it well, and after allowing it to settle, mix a fourth of this water with miat, which is used for syringing, which will entirely kill all mildew. Never leave the doors open for any length of time. It causes cold drafts of air through the vines. See syringing as soon as the fruit begins to color. Give water to the roots every week, whilst they are in growing state, till the fruit has fully swelled. The hints we have thrown out on the culture of this truly luscious fruit will, we think, enable any one to grow it at least to a small degree of perfection, and with a mediocrity of caution and observation, good and regular crops may be obtained for either pleasure or profit. End of section 19